Good morning and welcome back to another great installment of Inside Hollywood with Hawk Koch. Um, let me hand it over to Freda. Hawk, as always, a pleasure to see you and I'll check back in later with some questions. Thanks and thank you, Jen, for all of your fancy footwork, considering the power issues we had today. Hawk, always thank you for what you do and your extensive Rolodex. We love you, and this is going to be a fantastic interview. I have a feeling this is our 30th interview, but I can get back to you on that. Yet wow. another milestone. Um, so cool. thank you all. We're very excited. Well, and thanks, Freda. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everybody. Haven't seen you for a few weeks. Uh, full disclosure, Edward Norton is a real friend of mine. We have made two films together, Primal Fear and Keeping the Faith. And Ed is one of the brightest people I know who cares deeply about his family, his friends, and our world. He's been nominated three times for Oscars as an actor, Primal Fear, American History X, and Birdman. He's also a director, producer, writer, environmental activist, and an entrepreneur. And he is a loyal friend to me and to all his friends and collaborators. Welcome, Edward, and thank you for allowing me and all of our MPTF family to get to know you a little better. Come on in. Talk. There he is. So Good happy Edward. to see Good you. Good morning, Edward. Always the, always the best part of a day to see your, your gap tooth smile. <laughs> hey, I love it. I actually wore braces and it never worked. <laughs> <laughs> But let's get going because we have a lot to cover and I'm gonna cover as much as I possibly can. So let's start at the beginning. Your mom was a school teacher. Your dad was an environmental lawyer and a conservation advocate, later to become a US attorney in Maryland. So I wanna know what was it like at the dinner table with those two impressive people and your two younger siblings? Give me a little, were they talking about politics? Were they talking about cons Observatory, were they talking about getting the new Spider-Man outfit for you for Halloween? I, I'm going to admit I was a Batman kid. Um, I, I wore a Batman mask for most of the years between five and seven, apparently. Um, no, you know, um, you know my family, Hawk. It, it, it was a family, um, my whole family, my grandfather, uh, who was the, the real estate developer, Jim Rouse, who worked on the on affordable housing issues. And I, people around our family tables were always talking about uh, issues and ideas. Um, uh, I call it, you know, social entrepreneurialism. They, they really were people who were trying to think about how do we improve education? How do we improve housing? How do we work to defend the environment? And it, the funny thing is, um, it never seemed, I always thought it seemed fun. My, my dad made the work he did seem fun. My mother loved teaching and loved education. And she was a you know, career teacher, taught English, taught Shakespeare and, um, and theater. And um, they, they, made, they made that work seem more fun than work that was focused on making money to me. And, um, and I think that's, I got into it not so much out of a sense of kind of, let's call it a social obligation, but because my, my parents showed me at a very early age that um, if you love what you're doing, it won't feel like work, that old, that old adage. Uh, but at the same time, um, my mother and father were, they were not artists, but they were the kind of people who keep us all in business. They saw absolutely every play that went through Baltimore or Washington or our community theater, they watched movies. I mean, we, we were talking about movies all my life, you know, and my dad had his types of movies that he loved, The Great Escape and The Magnificent Seven and Marlon Brando and this, that. my mom loved Woody Allen and, you know, Dustin Hoffman and introduced me, um, to, to Hal Ashby, she loved Hal Ashby movies, you know, and, uh, 
and and it was it was we talked i grew up with people who weren't artists but talked about art and loved films in particular so that was a big part of my growing up so as a kid did you have a career in mind obviously maybe not a fireman or or a <laughs> policeman what but what was what did you what were you thinking i mean acting it wasn't acting at the beginning was it well yes and no i mean i loved acting i started taking i saw a I saw a play that a babysitter of mine was in when I was five years old and I asked to be in it. I wanted to be in that play. I, uh, and I had some notes about it, uh, but <laughs> no, but I, um, I, uh, my babysitter, my babysitter signed me up um, for acting classes when I was five and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I was, I was hooked on it from the start. Um, I, I loved mimicry. I, I watched movies and copied voices. I loved it. I didn't, I didn't relate to it as a thing you did when you grew up. It just seemed like magic to me in a way. It was play. I, I didn't have a sense. I wasn't one of those kids who dreams of Broadway. I just didn't have that. I, I can't explain it. I didn't, it all seemed too far away. But, but when, you I, went, when you went to when you went to your, what was the first film you actually saw in a movie theater and did, what effect did that have? Do you remember that first film? That's a really good question. You know, I, I, um, it's possible that the first film I saw in a theater was the old, that Disney film, um, Escape, Escape to Witch Mountain. Um, I remember, I remember that. Now one. on it's, Disney it's, Plus. Yes, it is. I've, and I've showed my kids, uh, by the way. I, I do remember going to see things in that era, like the Shaggy DA, you know, and um, and Kurt Russell, those Kurt Russell Disney movies, the computer that wore tennis shoes and the strongest man in the world. I, I, I loved that stuff, you know, and, um, um, but I, 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 let's see, Star Wars came out when I was seven, right? So I, I remember vividly going to the Senator Theater in Baltimore, the big old Art Deco movie palace where you remember we, we did a premiere of Keeping the Faith uh, and Primal Fear actually. But um, I, I saw Star Wars at the, at the, uh, the Senator Theater and that, that was a, you know, in your, in your brain for the rest of your life experience. It was very, very um, memorable early movie experience for me. So, was it before you, obviously, I'm, I'm assuming before you ended up at Yale Drama School, do you tell your parents, you know, acting is what I want to do or? No, no. And I actually, when I, you know, I went to, I didn't go to the drama school. I went to Yale undergraduate um, and I went, I thought I, I wanted to study physics and astronomy and, um, and, and started off on that program um, before I realized I didn't, I didn't have the math <laughs> skills. Um, but I, and I pivoted to get, I got a history degree there. But you know, I, I've, I've sometimes reflected on the fact that I, I, I think for, apart from the fact that I just loved theater and films and I loved, uh, I loved acting, but I, I also think that to me, I always felt it was a great way to not have to choose one path in life. I, I struggled with that idea of, career. I, I struggled with the idea of, um, of, um, of having to, to choose between so many things that I loved and was interested in. And, in, and, and, and somehow in, in theater and in film, I felt like I had a gateway into, into worlds of experience, you know, like it was like I've said sometimes it was like a, a skeleton key that lets you into any room. And, um, and you know, I do a lot of other things in life. You know, I, I'm involved in a lot of other things. I go through ebbs and flows in this time in my life of how much I want to work. But, but, but I, I always know it's there. You know, to, to me, the allure of it remains that it takes me into these worlds of interest. Um, and and uh, not so much not so much the challenge of can I do it anymore, but because I, I, you know, I, I, I know, I know, I'm, you know, I, I feel like I know my way around it, obviously, but, I, but it, 
but it remains endlessly fascinating to me because of the learning I get through it and the, and the people I meet and the places I get to go and the experiences I get to have. I feel, I feel that the mo working in the movies has opened up my life. So did you do plays at, at Yale? I did, yeah, yeah, I did, but I wasn't- Was there was a not... character? Was there a character or a play where you, where you just went, wow, now this is, man, I just love this. Well, I think people who knew me back then think it's funny that when I started working in films that I, I there was a dramatic bent to my, um, my performances because um, the, the plays I did at Yale, the first play I did was Woody Allen, a play by Woody Allen called Don't Drink the Water. Um, you know, and, 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 I, and I, I did a thing where I sat back in a chair, a lounger chair, and it rolled over backward and I spilled onto the floor. And the, I got such a laugh. I got such a laugh that I was, I, you know, I could hear the girls laughing and I was like, I'm in, I'm hooked. You know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm here. That's how um, Chaplin did it. Yeah, but I and I and I um and I did Midsummer Night's Dream uh, in college. I was in the Rude Mechanicals, and we got big laughs. I remember that. I did, you know, I did, I did, um, I did some Chekhov, and I did some things in college. I, I, I kind of, I, but I also did Hawk. You'll like this. I was in Damn Yankees. But you I was thought one, about the game. I was one of the baseball players. You know, wow. uh, in did you Damn did Yankees. you sing? Uh, did you sing "You Gotta Have Heart"? Were you one of those guys? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I so so. Um, you know, um, fortunately, I fortunately I only say that because I've acquired all of the videotapes and I've burned them, so they're <laughs> inaccessible. So I'll share I'll share it now that I totally control the record. Damn. But Damn. <laughs> but um, but uh, um, I loved it. I it was I did not I did not. It, confront myself with the with the idea that I wanted to pursue this as a career until I was about until I was about a year or two in New York after college um, and realized that um, I had a I had a very interesting opportunity that's not even worth it I had a really interesting opportunity to go work overseas uh, um, right you went to Japan right no, this was this. I did do that. No, I, I. It was later after college. I had this. I had this. I, I had an opportunity to work for the government, um, uh, you know, in a in a State Department kind of a capacity because of my language stuff and everything. And I, and I balked at it. And I thought to myself, Why am I not doing this? And I realized it was like, I, I there was a. I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to do this play with some friends. And I, and I thought, Why am I pretending this is a hobby? This is obviously what I get the most enjoyment out of so I sort of I sort of just accepted that I'm giving it a, I'm 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 going to take a stab at this for real with focus oh, okay so now I know your your brother and your sister and I knew your mom and and I know your dad were you able to say to them you know no I'm not going to the state department and I'm not going to <laughs> at the moment at least work for the Colorado River Trust or something right. I'm going to really take a stab at acting that was not hard say? no that was not hard my my parents my parents never missed a play that i was in they loved it they um they my dad was probably one of the first people to say you like being an actor why don't you be an actor like you know he to, i mean it was it was absolutely it was in you know they they were the best they 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 thought i was good <laughs> i mean they they were my mother thought, you know, my mother said, you know, you're, you're goddamn good at this, go do it, you know, and, uh, and, and, and the person I maybe felt a tinge of a sense of apprehension was my, my mom's dad, my grandfather, because he had paid for me to go to college, he paid for, for me to go to Yale, and, um, and I felt he was such a, a, a force, um, you know, I mean, he was celebrated on the front page of the New York Times when he died, and he was a legendary humanist and progressive uh, urban thinker. And I, I felt nervous about saying to him that he had given me this opportunity to go to an Ivy League school from my little public school. And, um, and, I, and he was great too. I told him with apprehension that I wanted to do it, but that I felt that I had an obligation to 
to do more of the kinds of things he was doing. And he said to me, he said, you, for, you forget, I had a whole career until I was 65 years old. And then I, I figured out how to be of service. He said, do, you know, you go do, the arts are important, go do it. And you'll, you'll figure out how to be of service in due course. Uh, uh, and he, he kind of gave me the permission. You know, That's incredible. What, yeah. what a great support. Yes. Not a lot of people get that. No, kind I of got support. great support. Great support. And, um, and you so why know, did you end up going to Japan? That, that was in college. I, I spent some time in Japan in college working for my grandfather. Um, ah, got it. Was doing but it. you learned, you still speak Japanese? I'm okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I, 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 uh, en enough to, enough to, enough to impress people at a junket in Tokyo. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but, okay. Uh, so you come back. You're in New York. You're you're a working actor in theater. You're trying to. You're auditioning for movies, and I guess a few people in New York knew you. And uh, I'm in uh, L.A. getting ready to do this movie, Primal Fear, and Deb Aquila, the head of casting at the time at Paramount, is looking at hundreds and thousands of people to play the role of Aaron Stampler in the movie Primal Fear. And Deb and you both have told me a story that I kind of love where she auditioned, I don't know how many hundreds of people in New York. And she called us and said, uh, I think I may have found somebody that we ought to test. What happened in that audition with you and Deb? Because you said it, it was different for you than the others. Well, um... You know, the, I I had been I had been kicking around in New York. I I was doing theater mostly off off Broadway. I can't even credit myself with off Broadway because I really, yeah, you know, I um I wasn't getting paid. I didn't have a union card. Um, I auditioned for Yale Drama School and did not get in. Um, and um, and I'm glad I'm glad I didn't. In retrospect, I. But I was doing plays downtown, and I, and I, um, I was in a play by Brian Friel that um, that Edward Albee saw. Uh, I actually wrote him a letter because I was a fan of Albee, uh, big fan, and I I tried to ask for his permission to produce a play he had written. You had to write him back then, and. Um, and he came to see me in this play and he like, he, he, he hung around and he was very complimentary and he asked me to audition for a new play that he was writing, which was being produced by the brand new Signature Theater Company. Um, and I, that was my first like paying gig. I got 155 bucks a week uh, doing that Edward Albee play with the Signature Theater and formed a friendship with Jim Houghton, the founder of that theater that has that lasted 30 years we we grew that theater up and ultimately built you know a, a frank gary designed three theater complex on 42nd street so my path really started for me in new york it in the theater it was with signature and albie and in and around that time i i used to go i used to go to auditions and i wouldn't get them but i would hang around and i would say Hey, if you need a reader, I would love to be a reader for your auditions, you know, because I thought then I'll get to see the audition process. So Deb, I didn't know Deb, but Deb in New York in those days, she was the independent film casting director, you know, Sex, Lies and Videotape, Last Ex Exit to Brooklyn, everything. She did everything cool. And so when I finally got into audition for something, her partner, Jane, really liked, liked me. And, and I worked as a reader there sometimes and and so when the word got around you know I don't know if you remember this part but you remember Maura Tierney Maura Tierney played Richard's assistant right in um in Primal Fear that role they read a friend of mine named Connie Britton Connie was a friend of mine from New York she she had got done the Brothers McMullen and it had been a hit at Sundance and she went she went and auditioned for the Maura Tierney role. And Connie came out and was standing by your office on the Paramount lot on a payphone. And she called me from the Paramount lot, this is true, and called me in New York and said, I'm, I just read for this thing. 
and they are looking for this someone in this role and it's you she said it's you you're the person that i know who has to read for this role you have to get yourself into deb aquila so i sent a fax <laughs> i sent a fax to deb and jane saying you may remember me from these four auditions that you didn't cast me in <laughs> But but you said, uh, you know, almost anyway, I said, I'd really like to read for this if you come through New York. And sure enough, they 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 got back to me and I thought, you know, I felt very special. Then over the next few weeks, I realized that every single actor in New York under the age of 27 had an audition for Primal Fear, like it was <laughs> everybody. And everybody was proud of themselves. And then they realized everybody else was getting to audition too. And we all thought, oh my God, you know, blah, blah. Yeah, but you, you, you told me something about Deb getting down on the floor. So I went in, yeah, I went in and I thought, I don't know if you remember, um, the, the, I felt like, I felt pretty confident about the, the sort of the, the, the darker side of the character. And, but I felt, I felt that the biggest part of the, trick of the film was the sucker punch, right? If, and I thought, look, you know, you have to buy that this lawyer gets taken in by this guy. You, you have to buy that. So I started thinking like when I was working on it, what, what just breaks your heart? What makes you think a person is helpless right away? And I thought about, you know, how I feel when someone stutters, you, 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 you literally want to help them. And it wasn't in the script, but I thought, I thought a painful stutter might really just make your heart break for this kid, you know? So I was never a fan of talking to casting directors. I always thought you should just go in and do the thing, not chit chat and do it. So I, when I went in with Deb, I just kind of went in in character, uh, sort of painfully stuttering and things like that. And she gave me this funny look and then, and then she sat down kind of on the floor with me and did the, the scenes of the, you know, some of the Fran McDormand scenes and some of the Richard scenes and stuff like that. And I had never actually had a casting director do that. There was always usually a reader and Deb read the scenes herself uh, off book, which was amazing. She just did the, did the scenes with you. And I loved it. I thought right away, I thought, I love her. This is so great. We're like, you know, we're right in there with each other and there's no camera and all of it and i i felt connected to her i thought i thought she was terrific and um and i guess it made an impression on her and then she when greg hoblet came back through new york i think he went to chicago and new york with her to kind of read her top picks and and we i did it there and then you know and then i you remember i i mean i had this apartment it was 400 i had a 400 square foot apartment on the on the upper west side and and, uh, you know, that was the first time, like, I didn't have a SAG card, but for whatever reason, you guys sent me a limousine to go to the airport for the screen test. <laughs> so a stretch, like a stretch pulls up in front of my apartment building. And I remember the old lady on my floor looked at me and like, was like, what, what is happening? And um, the first time I went to LA was to screen test for Primal Fear. And I, and I arrived on the night, I arrived on the night of the Forrest Gump Oscars. Do you remember that? Yeah. It was the night sure. of the night. And I and you guys had me at the Bellage Hotel on uh, across from the whiskey. And, well, um, and, and I, I must when yeah. I first met you in the trailer across from stage ten, you were stuttering and you stayed totally in character. And all of us thought you were in fact some hick hit <laughs> from Kentucky. You had us totally. And I remember you telling me that as you were walking out to go to the stage, you saw some guy with long hair. And you, so who, who did you test with? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I thought, oh God, I've come all the way to screen test and they've got some friggin' hippie. Uh, some hippie is gonna read the scene with me. Look at him, he's got like Kabbalah bracelets on and Tibetan, uh, you know, beads and stringy hair and like down to his shoulders and everything and then I, you or Gary or someone said, you know, Edward, this is Richard Gere. <laughs> I thought, oh, wow, <laughs> he doesn't look like a slick lawyer today. Um, uh, you know, he was just back from Tibet or something like that, right? 
But well, you know what, I, Hawk, I have a memory. I don't know if you remember this, but one of the times I thought you, that, you know, I said, I'll probably never meet this guy again because, you know, but it's been fun because I'll, I'll go home and they'll give it to, you know, Matt Damon or something. But the, um, but uh, uh, at some point you said to me, you said, you know, don't, don't, you said something like, look, don't get ner Richard's there for you. He's don't, don't be nervous or something. And I said, I said, I'm not nervous about him. Michael Chapman is shooting the screen test. <laughs> I said, I, I said that he shot Raging Bull and Taxi Driver. I said, that's that's a guy I'm nervous about. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> and you kind of gave me this look like, who is this guy? <laughs> well, I have to tell you and the audience out there that when you were doing the the scene where you switch from Aaron Stampler to Roy, the dark character in the screen test, uh, after Greg Hoblet, our director said, cut, gear turned around towards all of us who were behind the camera and went, oh my God. And all of us looked and went, oh my God, we have found, we have found Aaron. We were blown, literally blown away. We went, we showed the test to Sherry Lansing, who was head of the studio. And Sherry wasn't sure and decided that she wanted a second test. So I love the story of you meeting Sherry Lansing and having to get something you didn't know, something called per diem. Well, yeah, I, so I figured after the screen test that my time at the hotel, you know, I don't know why I checked myself out. I just figured, you know, I just figured it was, you know, things were done. I don't know why, I, I, I think. So I, you guys sent me in to meet Sherry in her office, right? And, uh, but you had already said, well, the, I'll tell you one funny thing. I went to Santa Monica for some reason while I was waiting after we did that test. And I was walking around in the Third Street Promenade, you know, in that area, right? And I, I could see, <laughs> I thought, Again, I was staying on the Sunset Strip and I thought, I didn't know LA at all. And I thought, you know, I feel like walking. <laughs> so I said, I was like, I think I'm gonna walk back. I had no idea like where I was, where Santa Monica was relative to the Sunset Strip. So I started walking back and I got to literally, I got to like the Brentwood shopping mall. And I, and I realized like the Hollywood Hills were not getting closer, right? So. I remember thinking, God, it's getting late. I wonder, I had an answering service, right? So I went to a, I went to a, um, a payphone by the California Pizza Kitchen at the Brentwood Mall, I remember, and I called the thing and there was a message. It said, Greg Hoblet would like to speak to you. Please call. And I thought, if I, I thought if I didn't get it, if I didn't get it, Deb would call me, you know, and say, you were great. It's not gonna work out, but it's great, blah, blah. I said, I think, I think I got it. Like, I think, what? I think maybe I got it. And when I called in, Greg's assistant says, oh, he's excited. He wants to speak to you. And I thought, oh my God, I, I'm going to get this part. And then Greg says, hey, it was terrific. It was this and that. We want you to stay through the, we want to rehearse tomorrow, stay through the weekend and we'll reshoot it on Monday. <laughs> I thought, oh no, right? So, um, so, I remember we rehearsed that we rehearsed in your office actually. And, um, and uh, uh, then I went in to see Sherry and I remember Sherry Lansing is so elegant and tall and everything in her pants suit. And she points at a picture of the Godfather and she says the movie that saved Paramount. And then she, that, <laughs> then she takes, takes, <laughs> takes me into her office and she goes, listen, she goes, um, you know, they want, we're going to do it again. But as far as I'm concerned, it's yours to lose. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's no what she said to me. I said, I said, I, I think I said to her, I said, oh, thank you, Miss Lansing. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, and, uh, but, um, but then she realized I had checked out of the hotel and she picked up the phone, very grand. She picked up the phone and said, this young man may be starring in our next picture, you know, uh, Get, put him back in the hotel and get him. And she said, what do you want? I said, a convertible. She goes, get him a convertible. And she hangs up the phone. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the thing, I, I, it's, we're all, we're, we're telling too many details, but the thing is that was 1995, right? That was the spring yeah. of 95. So I, I was 25. I, um, 
anything like that special your first your first sort of the whirlwind of all that it's it's special it's fun but there were things that i think people here especially will appreciate which are it was still that era you know there was a lot of independent films you know there was there was kind of this new independent film thing going on but at the studios for me as a as a real lover of hollywood you know norman lear's office was across the alley from where we were shooting and you took me over to see bob evans at his office and he had just written the kid stays in the picture you remember he gave me the kid stays in the picture in galleys he gave he gave me it to me in galleys and we uh, had read it kid uh read it <laughs> Remember he said he said well uh, people are telling me Dustin should do the, uh, the 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 audio book and and you and I were both like no Bob you should do the audio book <laughs> um, but uh, but you know there was I had this feeling of I feel like I got a taste of the of your dad was there Bob Evans was there Norman Lear was there um, Michael Chapman was shooting the film we were in the stages uh, and you were telling me this got shot here I. I felt like I was getting this this taste of that old Hollywood lot feeling, and we would be working. Remember, and then there would be premieres. There were so many premieres on the lot back then, right? They had that new theater, and and just you know, almost two or three times a week, I felt like we'd be wrapping up, and there'd be some premiere, and and you could like walk. I'd walk over and go see Braveheart, with you know, or or you know something like that. And, Congo. Yeah, Congo. I remember going to the Congo premiere too. I think it was at the Congo premiere that I happened to be wearing black jeans and a white shirt. We had just finished the day shooting and a studio executive at Paramount who shall remain nameless handed me their plate like, like and asked me to get them a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, so now I want to back up a second because after the second test, we all look and we're now, you're now going to get hired. So who tells you that you got the part and what was your, who, who did you call first? Um, well, Greg, Greg called me as, as was appropriate. Um, right. He was wonderful about it. Um, you know, he was, he was great. Um, I, I think after talking to Greg, I called Deb uh, because I felt she, you know, Deb, Deb, Greg gave, Greg gave me that break, uh, obviously backed by you guys, but Deb, Deb advocated for me to, Deb was, you know, elevated me through that process. And I think advocated for the, from the get go to Greg. And I think it carried a lot of weight with him. And so I think I ran over, um, I, I met I met I met up with Deb. She was tearful. She was so happy. Um, and you know, Deb, Deb, many people know Deb probably in this cohort of people. She was a, a great advocate for actors. She is a great advocate for actors, but she, you know she's actually I actually interviewed her a few months ago. For oh the great, show. yeah. But yeah. you know, there are a lot of people, me and Adrian Brody and 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 many, you know, many others, countless people had their careers broken open by Deb. Um, and, uh, and so I, I felt really bonded to her and grateful to her. And, um, you know, I, I, I let my parents know, obviously, but I, um, I, uh, when I came back to the hotel, I had this message on the hotel machine from Richard, um, that was really sweet. And, uh, you know, I, nobody had an iPhone then. So I ran, I ran out onto the sunset strip to find an electronics store and I bought myself a micro cassette recorder so that I could run back to the hotel and record the the message from Richard, which I still have. Um, you didn't you didn't uh, get erase that one. No, no, I've got it. I've got it. I recorded it. But the the funny thing is we were talking about my mother. Um, I I called her on the phone and I I played it for her and she she just she was, you know, officer and a gentleman was like forget me getting a part. She was like, you know, Richard was like one of her, you know, next in line after Paul Newman and Robert Redford. Right. Um, and, and, uh, she, she said to me, will you send me that tape? You know, will you send me that tape? I said, no, I'm not going to send you the tape because you're going to play it for everybody. 
And I said, just for you. And she said, no, 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 please. I need it. I need it. So I said, okay, I'll make you a copy. I'll send it to you, but you mustn't, you really, this has to be for you and me. This is just for you and me. She said, oh, absolutely sweet. just for you and me. I found out that the day she got the tape, she worked in a 30 floor skyscraper in Baltimore and she, at a foundation. She went to the security desk in the morning at her building and got on the emergency intercom system and said, this is Robin Norton at the, at the Able Foundation. She said, my son was just cast in a Richard Gere film in Hollywood and she played his message over the intercom at the building. Like, <laughs> That's a story I've never heard. That's a gr great. So let me just say that uh, I believe that that uh, curiosity is one of the traits that separates the wheat from, from the chaff. And boy, were you curious. And working, other than seeing Evans and Norman Lear and everything, you asked me questions, <laughs> not not weekly or daily, but probably hourly or maybe every 10 minutes. And yet you, you, you kept going. And I think part of why you are who you are is your curiosity. And I'm assuming that as a little kid, because I had one of those little kids and I know you've got a couple of kids right now, but were you one of those kids that went every time you said, well, let's, let's go to, we're gonna go outside, why? Why? Sure. Well, me, I was kind of a self teacher. My parents were great, but I liked to just dig into things and, and, and learn them. I'll tell you what had more, you know, I, I have some, he knows this, but a person who in my teen, a person who had a big impact on my determination that you could be a professional in the theater was Ian McKellen. Because I saw him, I saw him do this incredible show. Uh, it was a one-man show about his life in theater, um, and I saw it when I was 17 in in DC. In DC. And he talked about he talked about Shakespeare, the Shakespearean texts, his relationship to them, and his relationship to a life in the theater. What it what it was for him, and it it had an enormous impact on me because he. I never really read any of those. Bio he he talked about the craft, you know, the craft of it, the the thing. And I, I really felt when you know the thing when you're on a film set and you realize what a trade craft it is. It's a trade craft. Like I guess it's an art form. But in many ways, I think we've 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 embraced for obvious reasons. We we love we romanticize auteur cinema, right? We 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 appreciate our auteurs and. But any great filmmaker, I mean, anyone you want to name who we consider the great auteurs are the first to say that, that a lot of in a lot of ways, what they do is consolidate the talents of other people around a vision. And yes, great directors direct and they, and they, they, they shape and sculpt and they do all these things. But when you work on a film and you realize that certainly when you direct a film, you know that 70% of the job is not your vision, it's your capacity to get other people's creative frequency dialed in to something together. And when things click, it's a function of people across dozens of trade crafts, you know, like the obvious ones, but right down to, you know, people, and, and that's, it's one of the things I just love about it. It's because Hollywood, you know, Hollywood is glitzy and the people out front take a lot of the, the credit, we, the applause. But the day-to-day -day work of making films is tradecraft work and it's this massively collaborative experience and you build this community and you try to get the chemistry of that community going. And on Primal Fear, that was just, to me, it was like, it was like getting, um, you know, it was like crack cocaine for the creative mind. I mean, it was like, you're sitting there, Michael Chapman is shooting it and this roster of great actors and your history producing films and, you know, Greg's history in television at the time. Janine, and, Janine Oppenwall, one of the great production designers. Yeah, so many people were, there were so many people, like, it's almost like all I wanted to do was absorb the, 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 
that trade craft because it's like it's like the a, a puzzle of infinite complexity and the more you understand what everybody does the more you feel like and sometimes i think people i i honestly i i realized this about even someone like like bob de niro right about who everyone says i've done two films with bob he's been a mentor and he's wonderful in his weird way but he but people think you know he's an intuitive actor he's not a cerebral actor and that's just that's just not true people people who even actors i think they need to integrate great actors integrate with that that community um of people doing things because you you build a you build a silent shorthand you know you build a silent shorthand with the with with the boom operator and with the camera operator and with with you've got to get into a dance with people and yes they you need them to become invisible in some sense but you're but they're in this dance with you um and when you do things in particular like like birdman or fight club or something where there's this massively technical challenge to even creating the shot you're you know it's not it's not even like the actors are out in front everybody's so in on it together and <clears throat> i love that i always i loved it then and i and i feel i was lucky i was really lucky in my early career that i got you know to work with some a veteran like greg and you and michael chapman and all these people and then milos foreman and and woody allen and you know my first run of films that i got to do was with matt masters i mean masters i i told i I, if I hadn't gotten the role in Cuc in um, uh, Larry Flint, I, I was ready to volunteer for Milos. Like I, I, I was like, I'll, you know, carry lights just to get you, get to watch the way he, you make a film because his stuff meant so much to me. <clears throat> so I, I, got, um, I got an incredible, I didn't just get a good career break. I got this incredible mentorship across my early films that was, absolutely priceless you know so primal comes out and you're the new wunderkind and everybody wants you and you get nominated for an oscar best supporting actor <clears throat> who told you that and who was your first call with that one i don't remember um well I don't even remember how they announced it in the days, you know? I mean, I don't, I don't, I think it was on TV. Uh, let me, let me go back. I think it was on TV. I, I think, it, I think, you know. Yeah. I think I got woke. I think someone called me and woke me <laughs> up because I was probably. <laughs> probably me. Yeah, could, could well have been. Um, so six weeks after the movie's open, you and I are walking down West 77th Street, or whatever yeah. set street yeah. you lived on. Memory. And I said to you, because I had told you the Dustin Hoffman story about The Graduate. <laughs> and I said, Edward, has anybody, you know, recognized you yet? And you kind of, uh, no. And then do you remember what happened? Because I do, if you don't. Yeah, I'm, you'll remember better than me. You're the rock. Okay. Rock. So you have, it's one of those just absolutely perfect moments. I said, Edward, has anybody recognized you? And you went, well, not really. And there was kind of a, you know, been out six weeks. It's a big hit. <laughs> People are talking about you and nobody's recognizing you. And a, probably a 14 or 15 year old girl in kind of a, a school outfit is walking towards us. And she went, oh my God, that's him. <laughs> He's so scary. That's him. And she ran away the other way. <laughs> so I said, Edward, I got to be with you the day the first person recognized you. That's funny. I somewhere not long after that, the, you know, I I probably got taken to one of my first Laker games, and Shaquille O'Neal did that reaction when he saw me, and ran ran and hid behind John Sally, <laughs> and and did a thing. And I was, <laughs> and I thought I thought okay, now it might be it might it might be happening <laughs> if. If Shaquille is um, hiding behind. <laughs> what I love about this interview, as much as I've known you, I'm get, I'm learning so many more stories that I can tease you about. I love it. Well, I don't know if I ever even told you this. You know, you you 
you know, obviously if you're, if you're coming into Hollywood and your name, even though I was always Edward because my dad is Ed, my dad is Ed as well. So my dad was always Ed and I was Edward all growing up and even my friends. Right. But, you know, being named Ed Norton in Hollywood um, among a certain generation had its, uh, you know, it's complexity. And I had this stretch in my early years where, you know, it's like not to mention that Eddie Murphy came out with his whole joke about what if Ed Norton and Ralph Cramden had been gay. Right. So, you know, I would I, I would catch it. I would catch flack. Right. And um, and uh, from all different directions. And I and I had this moment when you guys cast me in Primal Fear. It was very exciting. I actually had this moment where I considered my middle name is Harrison. I thought, should I change my name? Should I, you know, or should I make my my performance name Edward Harrison? It's a very, you know, Richard Harris, or you know, it's like I I I thought Edward Harrison sounded very um very uh you know Olivier-ish in my mind, right? Rex Harrison or something like that. I thought Edward Harrison, that's a good, that's a good strong name. You know, and I thought then I just avoid this whole Ed Norton thing and uh, all of it. And I, I actually was pretty close to, I, I was pretty close to coming to you guys and saying, I think I might like to do this in the course of shooting Primal Fear. And I don't know if you remember, my sister, my little sister came to visit while we were shooting it. And I happened to say it to her casually and she was so offended. <laughs> she said, I was like, well, wait, why would you care? And she said, because if this thing is a success, no one would associate you with me. <laughs> Good for Molly. Good so, for uh, Molly. So, that's, so it's, it's because of her that I, I didn't end up being Edward Harrison. All right, so you go to your first Academy Awards. I think if I recall, it was, uh, was it at the Shrine or the, Dorothy Chandler, it wasn't. Well, we ne I never got, we never got to go to the Dorothy Chandler together, you and I, we, it was the shrine, yeah. It was the shrine. Yeah. And a lot of people- The English patient we gonna... year. It was the English patient year. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people thought you were gonna win. Uh, and then Cuba Gooding won. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about, I've always remembered there was a really bad movie called The Oscar. And whoever, I, I think Stephen Boyd played the guy who, was sure he was going to win, and if his name was Stephen or Frank, you know his name was Frank, and it, and the guy the announcer says Frank, and he stands up and they say Sinatra, and they cut to Frank Sinatra and he doesn't win. <laughs> what was going? Come on, what was going through your mind when um, you know Cuba Gooding? Well, you know I I uh, I don't want to turn this into a, a sad thing, but I had had a pretty rough month, if you recall, because my mother had passed away like um, two weeks before the Oscars, right? And she had been pretty, pretty sick. You know, you, you remembered uh, after this lifetime of, of her being the one who really marinated me in films and being so excited. I mean, she was excited when I got Primal Fear. When I told her I got the Woody Allen film, you know, in the movies when the mom puts the phone away like this and then screams, she did, she did that because Woody Allen was really our thing. So, and, and she and my dad took me to see Cuckoo, uh, to, to see Amadeus at, at the Route 40 movie theater. And we, you know, so for my dad, the Milos Forman thing, this is, these, these were big things. And, you know, it was horribly, my mom really didn't get to see my films. I mean, she, Primal Fear, she, she was very ill. She did come to that premiere, you remember, but she was in a pretty diminished state. Um, it definitely landed with her, uh, and and Woody did a, a a very nice thing, which is in the days before you know DVDs and stuff, he actually made and knocked off a, a video of the work print of Everyone Says I Love You so that I could show it to her, which was quite quite unusual for him. Um, and um, but you know she didn't she didn't get to see any of any of really the, the if there was anyone in my family who would have liked all the glitz and glamour. Um, and who you would have had to drag out of the parties in embarrassment, uh, it, it was my mother. So it was, it, you know, the Oscars that year was, was bittersweet. And I, I, I in, in all honesty, I was a little unfocused on it. Um, and I just, I sort of drifted through it, but, um, but right, well, let's, know, let's... I, I feel, I, I've always felt by the way that, you know, those things, I, I feel it even more so now, they're just, 
it, it's just a com it's a wonderful compliment. Like when you get in the mix of that thing, the people, you know, winning it and all these things, it's, it's, it's the, the, the Oscars is the only thing out there, the only one that is an, that is an authentic compliment from the large peer group of people who actually make films. Everything else is just, is just silly, honestly. Like th that, that's a terrific compliment when you get complimented by the, whatever it is, eight, 9,000 members of our Academy who actually are yeah. in the trade of making a film, right? But when you, when you get that comment, it's just wonderful to be in the mix. And, and the most fun of the whole thing to me isn't even the kind of chaos of an award show. It's, it's the lunches and the, the things where you get to hobnob with people. And the thing I remember most from the Oscars in that, you know, in that period, actually, I'm sorry, this was, this was when um, I, got, I got nominated for American History X, but Ian, McKell Ian McKellen was nominated with me. Um, what one time Ian McKellen was nominated with me and I had seen him on stage, you know, I, I mean, he was literally one of the reasons and I had told him this and, and, um, and, um, and I, I went and said to him, just, isn't this just the greatest, you know? And he, he said, he said, <coughs> Ian says, no, it's, it's awful. It's awful. And I said, why? Well, it's great. We're together. He said, no, it's awful because I want it. I want it and I'm not going to get it. <laughs> And I said, I said, well, you might, uh, you might. And um, he said something, he said, well, if it's you, it's great. And then he said something very inappropriate about Benini. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but who I love, I love, I'm the biggest Benini fan in the world. <clears throat> but if you remember when Benini won, he ran, he ran well, over, climbed the over the, climbed over the chairs. And, yeah. he, and he stepped on Ian's ear, um, which, oh. would, <laughs> which didn't go down so well. But <clears throat> my point is I, I, I have always felt that um, <clears throat> the the Academy and the Academy Awards are just, it's so much fun to, it's its just fun to be a part of it. You have to, you have to, you have to I mean, I was, I remember sitting across the aisle from Ray Fiennes that, that primal fear year and I thought he was the greatest, you know, the absolute greatest. And now he's a friend of mine and it's like, it's just, it, it's all hilarious. I, I, I understand. <laughs> I, I was fortunate in my early days I got to work with Myrna Loy <laughs> and Charles Boyer. Oh, wow. You know, people who I, you know, so I get it. I, I get it. Yeah. And now, um, now the younger people, even though you're still young, but now a lot of the younger people are, oh my God, I got to meet Ed Norton or I got to, you know, I, I got to sit across from him because that's happening to you now. And, and fun things happen to, you know, the Birdman, um, your, um, uh, Ethan Hawke was not was also nominated for for um, Boyhood, which was so great, and <clears throat> Mark Ruffalo for um, uh, Foxcatcher, I think. And you know, Mark, Mark, and Ethan and I, we all came up in New York in the same period. I've known those guys all, forever, and and um, and <laughs> literally that was the year. It was like J.K. Simmons, you know, was Whiplash. He won literally everything. I mean, like every single possible event. He won the Buster Brown Shoe Store Best Artist Award. I mean, he won, he, he won everything, right? So the entire time, Mark, Mark and Ethan and I are just sort of like along for the ride, right? And, 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 and we were having so much fun. We would stand in the aisles together and <laughs> we would stand in the aisles together and it's just a riot, you know? It's like you have, you, you, you can't do anything but, but make a good time out of it because if you take it, overly seriously then you then you um right. you know well you, let's let, let's quickly because we don't have a lot of time left believe it or not um, <clears throat> what you and me hawk you and me <laughs> what we're gonna have to do three or four of these uh but i want to quickly go through a edward norton film festival and i do want to ask you working with milos you've you've been with directors on stage mm -hmm. you've worked with hoblet what I forget was Milos first or Woody after Prime? Uh, Woody, I, I did Primal Fear. Okay, so I did. So Woody you work with Woody, Milos Forman, yeah. And and I'm sure you did imitations of Woody because I I remember you doing them for me. But as a, as a director, give me Milos and Woody and the difference of working with you and 
what your process was and how you uh, navigated, I guess, with both. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Of I'm, course. East yeah, no, no. I think that I think that um, it's a it's a very good question, and it's a good you picked a good pair too because Woody, um, you know, Woody um, would shoot a lot of stuff uh, in a single take as he always has, right? Uh, he would, you know, and I remember, um, I remember Michael Chapman telling me that Gordon Willis, Gordon Willis, who shot Manhattan and Annie Hall and so many other good ones, your, your old pal, that he had said that on Woody's films, if it's, you know, if it's, he takes a 40 and a zoom and that's it, <laughs> like, you know, and, and then right. if it's anamorphic, he takes a 75 and a zoom, right? And, and, and there's, there's a point in that, which is Woody, Woody sets up a very carefully curated frame. In some ways, working with Wes Anderson has been very similar to working with Woody in that sense. It's very curated, very curated, and very, very, and, and, and he likes to, to design his mise-en-scene in a way, and then he shoots it in a, in a take, and it's done. Milos, Milos is... Milos was a really educational experience for me because I revered his work. I mean, like really revered his work. And I, As, and I, for and me, I, I, always, I go back, I always go back to Loves of a Blonde right yeah, from the beginning. Loves of a Blonde, the Fireman's Ball, um, even, even the underappreciated Taking Off, which has some really funny stuff in it. But obviously, Buck Cuckoo, Henry. obviously Cuckoo's Nest, obviously um, Hair, you know, uh, um, bef and, and before even Amadeus and, and so. But M Milos was astonishing because <clears throat> for one thing, I began, I began to realize that he, he, wrote, he shot an enormous amount and he never seemed to have, he said very little to people. He, he cut them loose and he let them go and he shot a lot of film. And often, in fact, Philippe Rousselot shot that film and he, he would force Philippe to to cross cameras, right? Set up simultaneous cross cameras on coverage, which DPs hate, you know, for the obvious reason that they're sort of having to impossibly light in two directions and all these things. But it, it had to do with the fact that Milos, Milos really believed, he used to talk about the unrepeatable moment. He would, he would let things go and go and he would look and watch for something unexpected and magical that really brought it home for him. And I had the experience as a theater actor and then working with Greg and working with Woody. I, I sort of thought you need, to, you need to walk away with takes where it worked, where in your mind you got through it and it worked. Um, it was complete. The scene functioned as a scene. And Milos didn't work that way. He would, he would shoot for a long time and then suddenly he would declare, we've, we've got it. And I, I would go into a kind of a panic thinking, Things. And at one point I said to him, we really, can we please do one more? And he would say, no, no, no. I've got this piece from that and this and that. And I, re I realized over time that he had the capacity to sort of hold in his head everything that he had watched, almost like it was raw footage. And he knew when he had the clay that he was going to sculpt with editorially, he knew. And because my mom was ill at the time and I didn't work after that, Milos in, but he let me come and sit in the editing room with him a lot. And I watched him take this very formless material, material of scenes that had not coalesced as a scene. And he would take them and sculpt them into a scene that had not actually occurred that way on the day. And it was, it was magical. It was magical. And he, he once said to me, he said, you know, I'm really not a shooter. I'm really not a visualist per se, I, I'm great at casting. He said, I'm great at casting. I cast people who, who can do no wrong in the part so that no matter what they say or do, it's right. And he said, and I'm a, I'm a really good editor. Um, and, and, I realize, and he said, in between for me, it's just gathering raw material, gathering raw material. Um, he wasn't a, a constructuralist, he wasn't a visualist. And the, and the fact, and the, thing, <laughs> the only thing that's t difficult about that way of working, which you'll appreciate as a producer, is you need a lot of time. And you know, Larry Flint, Larry Flint 
was like a 90 day shoot. I think maybe it was an 88 day shoot, right? And he, I, he said to me, I, and we, what was primal fear? 54 days, maybe, right? Yeah. Something like that. And, yeah. and, and Woody's was even shorter. And I go on this third film and I look at the schedule and I say like day 89 out of 89, what? Like, you know, and he goes, yes, well, you know, it's shorter for me. It's a little bit tighter, but not so complicated. I said, tighter? I said, he, I said what, was, what was Cuckoo's Nest? He said, oh, maybe 160, you know, what, uh, something. I said, what was Amadeus? He goes, oh, we had, you know, two, 250 days or so. Yeah, I was like, I remember going like, what? Like, it was just, you know, it was just a different So, So, so we flash working. forward and now you're directing a movie I'm producing, which I, by the way, I can't tell you how many people say, oh, it's my favorite movie, Keeping the Faith. And you cast uh, him as, as a priest in the movie. And he has, I think, two or three great scenes. Now you're directing him. Tell me how, how that worked. Well, he resisted being in the film. I, I knew he was a terrific actor. You know, he, he was in some Mike Nick, he was in a Mike Nichols film once and he's very funny, very, very funny. And I said, um, I said, look, the, the, the older priest is my mentor. He, he, and I said, you're my mentor. I, I, I want you to do it. He said, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I said, listen, I'm going to get you a box of Cubans. I'm going to get you a box of Cubans. The priest can smoke Cubans and I'm going to make him check and I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to tell that story you told me about the Czech actress, but I'm going to make it a priest. And I said, so you won't even have to learn the lines because it'll be your story. And he said, and he said, okay. He said, okay, but here's the deal. If I do it, you have to take the film to the Karlovy Vary Festival in North Czechoslovakia to support our, our festival. I said, okay, fine. So, so keeping the faith played at Karlovy Vary because of my, my deal. But he, you know, <clears throat> he was great. He actually, he actually really loved the film. Um, so we, I have a question from someone who's at the home. Uh, I you, just want to, just want to, the question is coming from a, a man named Andrew Wald, who's an old friend of mine, whose father was a pretty, pretty famous uh, producer and studio head, Jerry Wald. And yeah. go ahead. Uh, Go ahead, Jen. Fan of your work. How difficult was shooting Fight Club, where there is a character that is in your imagination, in your mind, that you are, but Brad Pitt is physically there, but you're not, but it's supposed to be a character which is, exists only in your mind. So, how hard was it to uh, capture that when the no underlying novel also knows that this is a, a non existent real <clears throat> being? But someone in your imagination. So how hard was it to do those scenes? Uh, and I'll, I'll listen, hang up and listen. Thanks. Um, I, the hardest thing about working with Brad Pitt on a movie about shirtless fighting is that you have to look at him and then look at yourself. Uh, you know, and like you can do 20,000 sit-ups a week and you're, you're, you're still just like not going to be, um, you're never going to feel like you're up to snuff. Um, but, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the intricacy of the puzzle, the psychological puzzle of that film was actually, um, sort of so hard to keep track of in, in some ways that David Fincher, actually, I'd never had this happen before. And by the way, talk about a long schedule, the, the, the initial schedule was 129 days and I was in every day. I didn't have a single day off out of the 100. I think I was in 129 out of 130 that were scheduled or something. But, but toward the end, we had been shooting for so long that not just us, but even Fincher, I think, had lost track of, of everything you're talking about. And he shut the film down for a month. He shut the film down for a month to edit before we shot the ending so that he could make sure he didn't like mess something up. Um, which I, 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 I had never experienced before, um, you know, uh, but the, <clears throat> the experience of that film overall, though, was, was defined by laughter in my memory. It was, it was such good fun. It was funny. 
it was very generational. I, I think, um, I think for us, it was a lot like the way the graduate was for, for, you, you know, my dad and you Hawk, it was like, it, we, we wanted to stick our, we wanted to stick a finger in the eye of, of, um, of the, the, you know, the things we perceived as the establishment kind of, uh, traps, right? And, um, you know, in, in the graduate, it's plastics, right? And in Fight Club, it's, it's, you know, the franchising of everything. It's, 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 it was our, um, it had that feeling while doing it. It had the feeling of like being irreverent. And um, David, David used to say, it's a, 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 a semi-serious film made by deeply unserious people. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that encapsulates it. We, we, we were, um, we felt we were onto something that would, that our friends would, would identify with. And, and that's a, that's a special feeling. I mean, you think about the films you make and that you grow up on there. Everybody has the films that <clears throat> become uh, generational touchstones. And you hope someday, maybe you get lucky enough to, to work on something that, that goes into that place in an audience. And so even if you, <clears throat> even if you get to do one of those where where the people of your 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 own age sort of say yeah that's that spoke to us the way the graduate spoke to people or the way that you know i don't know what now but um but it, it was special it, it it was it was special but it was also really fun it was really really a fun funny experience so, so you mentioned you mentioned you now you've worked with de niro a couple of times but i remember talking with you and i said what's next for you and he said i'm you said I'm working, I'm going to work with Brando and De Niro <laughs> on the score. And what now, I mean, there's the giant there and you're going to work with him. I'm talking about Brando, obviously, as De Niro is a giant. What was it like walking on the set or walking into rehearsal the first time and seeing these two, you know, the biggest of the big? Well, I, I, I used to say to people that I did that movie for the poster. <laughs> you told that's I remember you um, telling me that. But because uh, because who wouldn't, you know, I mean, who wouldn't? Um, if you're my age, uh, if you're my age, Bob was one of the the people who made us all want to want to be in this game. He 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 had that transformational capacity, the, the chameleonic, and it wasn't just the intensity, it was sort of the, the I don't know, the, <clears throat> the sense that here's a guy who's not a marquee, you know, he doesn't look like a, a, a matinee idol type of an actor. And, um, uh, you know, Phil Hoffman was, uh, Phil Hoffman and I worked on a few things together and I loved him and he, he and I both worked with Bob and we talked about we talked about how, you know, how people like us have careers or in a way because of people like Bob and Dustin and Gene Hackman and um, Duvall, like they're, they're all, not that they're not compelling looking, but but character actors, the, the, you know, the greatest generation to us was this generation of character actors who were the post Brando kind of the character actors of the seventies and the eighties and, and um, who, who kind of inspired us to, to reach for that kind of a, a, a career. And so, you know, and I think obviously Brando meant that to many people, many of those people, a lot of, from Nicholson to, you know, so many got into acting because of Brando. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, in some ways it was funny because it was a, it, it was a, it was a genre film. It was a heist picture. It wasn't. It wasn't. Um, it, it was a. It was a genre film. Um, I'm going to interrupt you, Ed. I just. I just. But it was, I want to see that first moment where yeah. you're going to walk onto a stage or into a room. Um, and, okay. Well. And and somebody says, uh, "Marlon, here. This is uh, Edward Norton." Okay. So I had known. I had known Marlon before, which was ah. good. It was good. I'd known him for a few years, um, and I, I had a lovely relationship with him, and I. Um, he used to leave me messages, which I also used my micro cassette and recorded because he used it's he used to say he called me Eddie Spaghetti and he would he would say I would get these messages and they would go beep 
hey spaghetti it's bran flakes <laughs> uh, and uh he, he and then he would leave these wrong long rambling messages but he was very sweet and very very dear to us he he was kind and um interested uh asked a lot of questions and um and i i appreciated he was you know he was a, as many people know he was he was a eccentric and and but very broad minded and and broadly curious you you talked about curious and i think that marlin suffered a kind of a particularly terrible um version of fame isolation you know he 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 was so venerated he was so iconic that it it stripped a lot of people's capacity to interact with him as a human being and he really he really suffered from that i don't think he he liked the what he felt was the inauthenticity of the way people were interacting with him um and i think that he he, he it was it was a funny paradox because he was a deeply curious person i think he would have loved to have his anonymity back so that he could wander in the world and just experience it not as marlon brando not even just as a famous actor but as marlon brando of all actors and and um and it, and that was poignant uh, it was poignant uh in some ways to to see the way that his, the isolation affected him i think um but but uh you know, the first scene that the three of us did together was memorable, but not for um, the reasons you might think. We were doing a scene where we're in an empty jazz club and talking about a heist. Bob and I are pitching Marlon. No, I'm sorry. Marlon and I are pitching Bob, the notorious thief, on a score that we should take down, right? And, um, and, I, and I say something, to, and then Marlon takes it up, and then Bob is supposed to reply with his thoughts, his sort of, you know, things so i say my so they say they set up this kind of wide dolly track rotating around us in the club and i think to myself i'm like look i know both of these guys but still here we go you know like first take with the two of them together i let myself have a little smile and um they do it and the camera's sliding and i say my bit and marlon starts in beautifully hilariously on his bit saying this whole little speech and he's pouring himself a bottle of water into a glass while he's talking, except he pours it down the outside of the, of the glass and it starts spilling down his whole linen shirt front, pooling on his belly. And I'm looking at it like he's pouring his water all over himself. And I look at Bob to see if he's noticing this and, and Bob is, is falling asleep, um, <laughs> actually falling asleep. Like he'd been out late and he was sort of nodding and, and everything. They call cut because they see the stain on Marlon's shirt. They call cut and Bob sort of pops his eyes open and looks at me and he whispers, was, was I nodding off? And I said, yes. And he goes, he goes, oh God, oh God. You know, he starts like hitting <laughs> or something. And I thought like, well, I'm walking with giants, you know, like I'm. Uh... <laughs> oh, great story. Great story. So, uh, but so, it, was, it was great. It was fun. Um... I won't, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, sorry, somebody had a question, but there's a question here. Did you have, this is from, I, I guess a crew or a resident. Did you have any difficulty releasing yourself from the character in Motherless Brooklyn? Did it have any impact in your life when filming was done? That's a nice question. I, um, well, I loved him, you know, I mean, sometimes it's, it's not, Essentially, at least it's just you're fond of a person, you know, like I was very fond of him. Um, I mean, I, I spent a, I, I spent a long time writing that screenplay years and years as Hawk can attest. Um, I got writer's block on it because of the twisted noir plotting and I put it away in a drawer for a long time and then I got it out and I finished it and it, it, it was a long struggle just to get that one um, to actually be made. And so I, you know, I I put a lot of feeling into him. I, I related to, I looked at him as a, I looked at him as an extreme extension of myself in some ways, or like if things that I feel are in my brain were, were just that much more uncontrollable. And so, so I, I love, I, I really, I really loved him um, in his, in his tortured sort of isolation, but his strong character. And yeah, I, I can't say it was hard to let go, but um, 
my neck certainly uh, from all the twitching and everything, it took like uh, it took like a, a few months of chiropractic work to get me back in uh, in fighting shape. But um, but I I uh, it's more a kind of a, a some characters are there. It's fun to be in the skin of certain ones, and he was he 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 I. You know what's an interesting thing about that question is sometimes it depends on how things end up. Like when I watch the film, where he ends up, I feel good about. Like the girl is leaning on his shoulder and he's taking and he's sighing. And I actually sort of left him thinking he's okay. Like he's all right. He's he's going to be all right. And that it, it's sort of goofy to say that, but I actually feel that. Like I feel like, oh yeah, well, he's okay. He's okay. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Uh, so, and you you can put it you can put it down that way. Is there an is there an actor or a director today? I mean, we we didn't we haven't had time to talk about Danny DeVito or Spike Lee or or all the Wes Anderson movies. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there a is there an actor or a director today that you're thinking, hmm, you know, I wish I hope I get a call from this director or. I'm going to try and find something to work with that director or that actor. It's tricky. I mean, you can always gin up your own things, uh, but as an actor, I think, yeah. I mean, look, there's people I, I, I probably never will get to work with just I don't know the way they work. I, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson is one of my peer, but he's like to me, he's like one of my favorite favorite directors. Um, I don't know that I fit in his worlds. I don't know everything, but I. But I, I don't care. I don't, you know, that's the funny thing is I'm just happy he's there doing his work. I love it. Um, and uh, stuff like that. I love, if you guys haven't checked out the French, a French director named Jacques Odiard. Um, I'm, I'm obsessed with his films. He, uh, The Beat My Heart Skipped and Un A Prophet and uh, Rust and Bone and Deep on Oh, yeah. Made, I saw made, Rust and Bone. Yeah, he's made yeah. film after film after film that, yeah. He's like like in Yoritu in my mind. He's made he's literally made like like three or four films in a row that I think are all masterpieces. And I wrote him a I struggled I wrote him a fan letter in French a few years ago. Um, you know, getting my friend to help me write it. And um, you know, I I but um you know I, so I there you know there's there's people I I um, there's absolutely people I'm just you know thrilled by and that I think are are. Some I think are underappreciated, like Odiard. Uh, I'd love to work with, but I mean the list goes on and on. You know, there's 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 um, there's so many people doing really excellent work. And you did you know. did when you worked with Inuratu, um, when he when you first met with him, uh, was his process always? He always knew that he wanted to make it feel like it was one shot all the way through. Yeah, he did say he did say that. Um, but now Alejandro and I had been we had we'd been friends socially uh, for a while, and so I I, I knew him um, and adored him. He's he's just a vibrant vibrant person and and great intellect. And um, I had seen his span, you know, his film so good. But he the, the film he made before Birdman called it was a Spanish film with Javier Bardem called Beautiful um, that. I, if you haven't seen that one, please run it at the home. It's an absolute masterpiece. It's an emotional masterpiece. What, Javier Bardem's performance is one of the greatest he ever gave and is a just tremendous, tremendous yeah. performance. Um, I agree. When I saw that film, I, I bumped into Alejandro somewhere and I, saw, I, said, I said, whatever you are doing, anything you're doing, no matter the part, big or small, I want to be inside. I want to see what you're, pro I want to, I, I said I volunteer myself sight unseen to anything because that film I don't even everything I know about making films I can't I struggle to understand how you track the emotional line of that through a whole film shoot and um so he, when he called me I was just yeah I was ecstatic and when I read it when I read it I was particularly thrilled because it's such a funny weird human um thing and and the character of the actor was so funny and uh, and and um, you know it's funny. There's a little bit of you in that actor. <laughs> he he's the he's he's he. I know people like him, and in fact, Hawk, you know the actor, 
the actor he was most based on, who I actually vocally imitated in, in Birdman, there's a very specific vocal reference. And uh, um, I think if you watch it and you really- you have to, it, I gotta watch it again. You'll huh? know exactly who, exactly who it is. Um, but, uh, you know, um, that film was an example to me of this, of the, what we talked about at the beginning, just the, the beauty of the tradecraft of, of our industry, because I've never been on a film ever in my whole career where the successful completion of a given shot, some of them, I think the longest were in fact, actually about 12 minutes long. You know, we had some that were in the 12, 15 minute range with multiple scenes within that with very complicated stuff. Some were shorter, but the shorter ones maybe were seven minutes, you know, it, it would take, it would take, it, we rehearsed for six weeks, the camera moves, it was like a dance. If the boom operator banged the wall, you're done, the whole take, you know, nine minutes of things. If, if an actor flubs the line, every, so everybody's in this symbiotic synergy that you complete reliance on each other, each and every, you know, that, you know, we all know that thing. You're working on a film, this, the, everybody waits to see what the setup is, and then they go, am I, am I involved or not, right? And, and these days with phones and everything, you know, a certain percentage goes, okay, okay, I'm, you know, I, nothing for me, right? Uh, nothing in particular. On that film, everybody was involved in every shot fundamentally. And when you got it, it was like a World Cup soccer goal. When you finally heard Alejandro scream, that's it, you know, the entire soundstage, all, everybody jumping up and down, hugging each other, like, you know, like, like it was just, it was just, it was just joyful and very unique and very. Um, I, I would have really, loved to have been there. I would have loved yeah, to it was. It was. It was. It was special. But um, so uh, the Oscar nominations came out today. I'm not going to talk about them, but I am going to ask because I know you have a feeling about this. Is uh, how is there a way for the Academy to stay relevant and the Oscar to stay relevant in the world of now we have streaming and theatrical? Yes, uh, I mean, you, you know, I'm not saying this because of your incredible commitment to the Academy uh, over the years. Um, you're, you're one of the Academy's greatest champions um, and, I, I, and the Producers Guild, uh, you know, if, for those of you who don't know that Hawk essentially founded the Producers Guild and it was, it's, did all the heavy lifting to really get it off the ground and, and codify the way we, we credit producing work, which was so important. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a, I, I think that the Academy is, is wonderful. It's a wonderful institution, not just because of its historic sort of stature and role, but because it has the capacity to, in much quieter ways than people know, you know, incubate talent and share, you know, technical capacity. And so, so many things are great about it, but, um, and I think the awards, the, the awards are, as, as I said earlier, I, I do think they're special because the, it's, it's our industry. It's actually our industry, right? And I, um, without, with, I, and I want to say this in a way that doesn't, it, 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 I'm not insulting critics awards, but, but there's, there are conflicts of interest within critics awards in the sense that they've proliferated. They've proliferated for financial reasons because people have realized they can monetize an award show by televising it. And so our industry, because unfortunately we like, we like to go out and collect awards because frankly, it, 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 it amplifies our films before the Academy Awards, but, the, but, but it's been a race to the bottom in the sense that we now have too many other award shows. And, and in the old days, those were private dinners in New York or whatever, if it was a critics award, it was a private dinner. But now we have this incredible proliferation of televised award broadcasts. And I don't think it makes our industry look good, first of all, because there are people in the world doing very important work. The Nobel Prize winners just collect it once, you know? And I, I don't think it, it makes it us look good to take that many bows for the same work once a year. But, but that's, my, that's a personal thing. When it comes to the Academy, the, the Academy Award is so different. It's, it's, such a, it's such an authentic, deep compliment from the people who actually make films. And by the way, not from just 50 or 60, as tend to be in a critics group, from thousands of people 
who actually do the work. And the system of nominations by the divisions, by the departments is such a good way of doing it. Um, but I, I think that, you know, and look, the Academy telecast challenged by COVID, but it will return in the future. It's important to the Academy. That's how our Academy underwrites important programs and all these kinds of things. And, and our own award program has been devalued by this, this marathon of televised awards. And I, I do wish, you know, everything has to evolve. You learn as you go. It's, no one, it's not anyone's error, but sometimes I think you have to wake up to what's happened. And I, I think our academy, collectively, we should really look at a couple of things. One is with streamers in the mix and the incredible differential of financial capacity between streamers that don't have to market their films and the studios and mini studios like A24 that do have to market their films for the theatrical release. I think, I think that the, the running of paid solicitation for the awards, the four-year consideration ads, I think this needs to go away. I, th I think we need to say that you should not be able to take paid, you know, obviously you can market your film, but I think the millions and millions of dollars that go into paid solicitation for the awards should be banned by the Academy. And you can say, hey, you can do it for the awards, but if you take paid solicitation for award consideration, it disqualifies you for the Academy Award. Every studio would be absolutely thrilled because they don't wanna have to hurt the bottom line of the best films of the year, hemorrhaging money into solicitation for award consideration but also it would level the playing field a little more because, hey, if you're Netflix and you're not spending marketing money because you have a streaming service, which is a great business model and they make great films too, but, but you can spend incredible amounts of money on things like Academy campaigning and A24 and other terrific independent production shops can't do that. So I think as an Academy, we could level the field by by it's sort of our citizens united problem let's let's call it that i think we should take money out of the uh, out of that mechanism of campaigning but the other thing is i really do think we should consider saying that the academy awards has to go first like you, you that we think our award is special and and that absolutely critics groups should do their thing and people should go but that but that you're only eligible for an Academy Award if it's, the, if it's the only televised award broadcast or the first televised. If you go to televised, televised award broadcasts before our award, you can't be eligible for our award. And it may sound a little draconian, but to be honest, I think they should wait for ours and, and then and ours should get to go first because, because it would make it exciting again. It would make it unexpected again. It would make it, it would make it important. It, we should lead that conversation, not follow all these other ones. And um, and frankly, our awards broadcast would have much, much, much better ratings, and our academy would make more revenue. And that's 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 what should happen because because the academy is special. And and um, and I think we need to fight. We need to defend its its assertion that it is special. Um, because, because it is a strange era, it's a different era. And I think in some ways, um, we've let our, we've, we've let it get buried in the white noise of, of everything a little bit. And I think, I think there are ways we could burnish, um, the specialness of it again. Edward, uh, our time is out. Uh, I, I hope everybody had as much fun as I did. Uh, I got to learn more things about you than I, I and stories. Uh, it w I had so much fun. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jen Clymer, our director, has, I think, one last question that she always asks. But uh, sure, I yeah, thank, thank you, you for doing this with Absolutely. me. No, thank you. Uh, you know, I could go hours with you. But um, and also, I'm sure everyone watching has read Hawk's book, Magic Time. But if you haven't, you definitely should. He's the it's one of it's one of the most delightful Hollywood memoirs imaginable. Um, so, you know, thank you Thanks. Our copies are all at our library. So go get magic time now. Um, and I really appreciated all of this. Amadeus was a huge influential movie for me, as was Escape to Witch Mountain. <laughs> um, and I, um, yeah, I'm going to ask you the questions that we ask everybody. 
We've been doing this live broadcast since the beginning of the pandemic. It was a way to keep the residents creative and engaged and active, producing, they're still performing. Um, we have a poetry hour coming up at one o'clock and we did a radio performance of All About Eve that should be ready for a broadcast around YouTube soon. That's great. It's been a lot of fun. And it's been something that's positive in this crazy time. So um, today is episode 318 of our interactive live broadcast. Wow. And what we ask all of our guests is what is your favorite movie and what is your favorite television series? Because we are the Motion Picture and Television Fund. Oh my gosh, that's the impossible question. I um, wrote down that we need to broadcast beautiful for the residents to see. So. Yeah, um, beautiful. And um, I'd suggest a series of Jacques Godillard films would be another okay. um, one. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, Wow, favorite film is really, really hard for me. Uh, I, I, I would say that I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat a little and say that for me, the A side, B side. When I was kind of in my young adult life, probably the A side, B side of Taxi Driver and Raging Bull was, and it's an obvious answer in some ways, but they're actually very different sorts of films, and they if I ever wore out of a VCR tape watching and rewatching and rewinding those, those were, those were the films that, that really, 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 um, I was quite obsessed with, but of course, like anyone I could, I could go on and on. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, and say those. those in. Television series. Um, oh, it's unfair, unfair. I, um, I mean, I, I, I look. I'm a Baltimore. I'm a Baltimore. I'm a Baltimore boy. So I'm gonna. I you know I deeply love The Wire. I think that The Wire um, and and Michael K. Williams was a was a friend and graced my film. And I, I just think The Wire was like an American. It was it was the Dickens. It was like it was like it was like a Dickensian dissection of America. And it was so um, embedded in where I was from. I I just absolutely thought that was the highest art. Um, You're not the first person to say The Wire, which I think is a compliment because it is such an incredible television series and HBO yeah. at the prime of HBO revolutionizing what television meant. Um, Thursday, we are having a conversation uh, called The Industry Today about the term television and if it's archaic, what it means, um, which is one of the other things I love about the group of people that you have been speaking to. These are the crew that you were talking about. This, this is the backbone of the industry and they care very, very deeply. Age is not relevant when it comes to um, the art of filmmaking and the art of storytelling. I look, uh, yeah, agreed, agreed. I think we're in a great era, you know? I mean, I think it's, uh, some people feel de destabilized by it, but you know, in my whole career, I've been, Hawk and I did our first thing in 1995. So, you know, it's, that's, that's how long I've been in the business and many like Hawk have been much longer, but it goes through these interesting ebbs and flows. Um, when I was first coming up, people thought that the push into, you know, Miramax was rewriting kind of the, the they were showing that you could do low cost films that did great returns. And suddenly the industry was scrambling to replicate the Miramax model, right? And now we've, we've got, streaming, we've got all sorts of things. But I think it's incontestable. We've, in the 90s, we felt this was exciting because there was a lot more doors to knock on. There were a lot of people who wanted to make, um, the, the, find new voices and make cool and fun films. From an industry standpoint, the, the amount of opportunity right now to tell stories in whatever form you want to tell them in Sing, single narrative features, limited series, long form series. I mean, it's a golden age. It's an absolute golden age of storytelling right now. Like uh, content we, is king right we, now. We, we, and, 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 and more diverse voices, m more diverse voices, more strange forms and unexpected uh, uh, a structural approach to storytelling and just an enormous amount of work. 
I mean, I have never seen in my career, I've never seen younger people doing more high responsibility jobs. You know, it's like people are getting, people are getting the chance to climb the ladder in every trade in our industry in ways that are un unprecedented. It's really exciting. I mean, it's really, really neat. Um, and I think that's, that can only be celebrated, you know? Yeah. Um, Edward, I'm thank you, man. This was, this was the best interview of, this is my 30th. I've loved every minute. Thanks. You say buddy. that you say that to the, all the actresses, Hawk. <laughs> Love you. Love you. Talk to you later. Thank you, guys. Bye, everybody. Hawk, Hawk, don't go yet. Tell us who's coming up for Inside Hollywood in March. Oh, we've got uh, some guy named Henry Winkler. You know, you ever heard of him? Big Henry's coming with. I think uh, early March and. Uh, if everything goes right, we're going to have Sally, Sally Struthers as well. So uh, two, two more actresses along with Edward. So have fun, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>